You're listening to The Broken Meeple Show, a podcast that speaks passionately about board games for the benefit of those who play them. My name's Luke Hector, best known for The Broken Meeple YouTube channel, and I'm an everyday gamer just like you. And I'll be talking about reviews, top tens, and just about anything that connects me to board games, as long as I have a tea or coffee in hand, that is. So grab a cup, relax, and enjoy. And remember, it's only a game. Hello everyone, welcome to another podcast episode. Hopefully everything's recording fine, it has been a couple of weeks, and I did take a break for Easter for most of my blogging, although I say most. I still had to do a few videos, I've scheduled quite a lot over the next few weeks, and obviously planned a few things, but I did take a little bit of time off from actually recording new stuff to just kind of chill a little bit for these two weeks because you know I gotta go back to work tomorrow and I am not looking forward to it I mean you can never escape your job as a manager I just know from emails that have come through from the workload it's going to be stressful as anything when I go back it's like you take the time off to chill but on your mind there is always the fact that you've got to go back to work and that is just like a daunting thought you can't get rid of it so you can never truly relax but I did at least have a bit of time, you know, just playing some video games, playing some board games. I've got uh, Spirit Island. I've been playing quite a ton of that lately. If you've been checking out my Instagram posts, I've been posting up uh, photos of that, as well as obviously getting some other games played like uh, Dice Theme Park. I've got to do a sort of comparison video for from Alley Cat Games, a pre-Kickstarter, uh, Fractures of Time. Finally, I have played that properly with the expansion so I can do a Beyond the ga Base game review of that soon. So that's going to come out shortly. But I've also done some culling and acquisition videos as well that are going up one by one. And hopefully you'll find them fun as well. I even did some folded space uh, insert unboxing and put together and you know, I've done a review video of a bunch of those inserts. So there's plenty of content on the way as well as live stream stuff. I've got, I did a Q&A last night. That was good fun. Quite a... It was full of raves and rants alike. It was very heated, I think. It was a really good Q&A. But uh, next week, the collaborations will resume because obviously I took a break for Easter because my birthday was on the 4th. And next week, I'll be joining the Nerd Shelves for a top five list with uh, Michael, Judy, and myself. 15 games, talking about games that needed a second play. And the following week, I'll be meeting up with the Cine Meeple, who's a UK new creator, and we'll be talking about top 10 games that we want to play, but probably never will. Or, so, or top 10 games we'd like to play, but are never going to play for reasons. So that should be an interesting list. But with this, well, yeah, that's more to come another time, I guess. So otherwise, I'm feeling okay. As you can see, the hair is all over the place still. I mean, cool, blimey. Uh, you know, all over, growing over my ears and that. But light at the end of the tunnel. As of tomorrow, as much as I hate the fact that we got to go back to work, tomorrow, the next stage of releasing lockdown commences. So we get the gyms back, we get hairdressers back, we get non-essential retail back, we get outdoor restaurants back, we get massage therapy, you know, beauty therapy back. And I cannot wait for at least this stage. No, I can't go to the Dice Cafe and play board games indoors. That sucks. And yes, I can only have support bubbles round in order to play games indoors. That still sucks. But a lot of my stress relief outside of board gaming was gym exercise and massage therapy. I see a massage therapist once every couple of weeks. I like a good massage and it just helps me to sort of detox from whatever's going on in the week by just sort of lying there and just letting someone do their work. But the, and not to mention it's good after I've been to the gym and my muscles are aching like crazy, which they're going to this week. The gym bag is already prepped in the other room. I'm going to go to the gym tomorrow and I'm going to make up at least three times a week, if not more. Probably three times a week at the gym, maybe grabbing a swimming session while I can. I've got to book those in advance and hopefully I'll be able to resume that because I feel weak. I feel absolutely weak. I feel like my muscles have just eroded away because for the last couple of months I've done next to no exercise because the temperature has not been great for going out for runs and frankly running is not my favorite pastime anyway when it comes to exercise. I'd much rather do weightlifting and if I'm going to run I'd rather just run on a treadmill and do 25 minutes quick on there but I like hiking. I like walking, so hiking up hills and that. And I've done one or two of those recently, and my thighs certainly were not thanking me for it. But th that's the way I like to sort of do outdoor exercise, in a sense, hiking up hills. 
but I, you know, if I'm at the gym, I want to do weights, I want to do maybe like a bike thing, step machine, whatever for cardio, and swimming, I much prefer for cardio, swimming, I think is a much better exercise all round than running, because as well as exercising the legs, it's also exercising like, you know, your upper mus muscles as you're pulling yourself through the water, and it's not as bad on your back either, whereas running can take it out on your knees and your back equally if, if your posture is bad. So, yeah, from tomorrow, a lot of good exercise and stress relief to come. And the fact that I have got, I've got a hairdresser appointment for tomorrow afternoon. Uh, but I'm also going to try and get into a better hairdresser's first thing in the morning to see if I can get in on their walk-in appointment. And if I can, I'll stick with them. If not, I'll go to the other appointment as a fallback. But yet, yeah, before I go to the gym, this hair will be gone. I will be able to say, right, this is my short hair back again. I'll even be able to figure out what I'm doing with the beard because, you know, the trial period is kind of over for this and it won't grow much longer than this and I don't want it to grow much longer than this. So I'm kind of thinking, well, maybe I should just stick to a 10-day a stubble look. And if so, I'm going to obviously get the hairdresser to sort of give me his, the barber to give me his opinion and, you know, we'll trim it down if need be to go with the short hair. Like I say, I should look like a million pounds in my comparison tomorrow. So yeah, there'll probably be a before and after post us with everybody tomorrow on that front. But yeah, there's there's positive stuff on the horizon, shall we say. Now, in terms of the channel, there has been some interesting content as of late, I'd like to say. I've already mentioned most of it. I've mentioned the Q&A and some of these cull and acquisition videos. But you can also check out um, a King of 12 review. I did a Blitz review for that one. It's a small filler card game by Lucky Duck Games. Go check that one out. Uh, there's also a couple of Beyond the Base Game videos for the Fields of Fame and Halls of Hero expansions for Raiders of the North Sea. So that's something to look forward to. And uh, I think that's it for the, I've already mentioned about the acquisition videos and the cull videos. Hopefully they will be uh, popular with you. But in the future, I've already mentioned those videos coming out as well. So yeah, I think, you know, channel wise, I'm fine, really. I do think, well, one thing kind of worries me, you know, I'm getting a decent amount of views for short periods for, you know, cull videos and acquisition videos, fine. But you know, still less than a thousand for the Blitz review and still less than a thousand for the Beyond the Base game stuff. And Granted, I already know that the Beyond the Base game stuff is not very popular, apart from the people who have that expansion, but because the engagement is good on it and they don't take long to do, and I think they're informative, and I think in the future they will pay dividends, so I'm still doing those. But yeah, certainly, you know, I mean, the collaborations have not been too bad, but the last couple have no, not been anywhere near as good as, say, some of the collaborations um, earlier in March and late Feb. Maybe because I've had, well, I don't know, um, I had Side Game LLC. Uh, I suspect most people hadn't heard of him, but, you know, American uh, creator. Hexy Beast, you know, most people should know who he is from Solo Gaming. You know, I would have hoped to have got more uh, views on that one. But compared to some of the previous stuff, like with One Pit Wonder and Ryan and Bethany and that, yeah, nowhere near as many. It's kind of odd. I'm curious as to what the, the deal is with that. But as I say, the collaborations are still good fun, and I've already mentioned two that we've got. In fact, um, well, I'll mention a third one shortly, but uh, yeah, there's. I'm just sort of curious as to what's happened with YouTube. I think the algorithm's just kind of gone all over the shop, and if anything, I wouldn't be surprised if I'd been shadow banned in some way. But another thing that kind of gets me weird is the review numbers are just dropping like crazy like people watch the other variety content but the reviews just don't get as money whether it's the detail reviews or the blitz reviews have people just got bored with reviews and i don't just mean on my channel i mean in general you know do, when you watch board game content on youtube do you care anymore about the review content maybe it's just a maybe it's the start of the year there's nothing new and interesting coming out or maybe people have just got to the point where it's like, you know what, I don't tend to watch a lot of review content. I'm more interested in like the playthrough and the streams and stuff like that. And I wish I could do playthroughs. I really wish I could, but I just don't have a good setup. I mean, I've got a, barely any room to put a camera. I don't have an overhead camera. So the best I could do is have a diagonal pointing down shot at the table, which I could do, but I don't think you'd get much of a good view of the board and everything from doing that. So I don't know, maybe it's something I've got to experiment with, but even then I can only do solo playthroughs because I live alone, so I don't have the advantage that some other channels have. But is that just the okay? case? Are reviews really going the way of the dodo? I, I certainly want to keep doing the detail format 
when I can, but if it's not going to get the views, I don't see why I need to spend six, seven hours editing that one in order to get barely any response for it when the Blitz reviews can get a reasonable amount of views in comparison and take me half the time. But I suppose I'm just going to be a lot more choosy with the detail reviews and say like, look, this is really the hotness, the big game, the big trending game. They can get a detail review. Everything else gets a normal rapid review or so to the point where I suspect rapid reviews will be the norm and detail reviews will be the, you know, the more ad hoc ones. So we'll just have to see how things progress, really. I'm noticing a bit of reduction in views on a lot of channels, uh, although I suppose not the big trending ones, you know, because uh, let's face it, you go on Twitter and Facebook, you can't get them out of your subconscious. You know, some of the big channels will share all sorts of other ones, but ah well, that's the way it is. But let's talk about smaller channels because smaller channels are amazing. They are better in every way. And so I got a shout out for Alex from Gem and Biscuits. This is a UK creator from Birmingham and, you know, less than 100 subscribers. So he's pretty new, although videos have been doing for not that long. I mean, about a year, but, you know, the videos don't come out as often. You know, this is more of a side hobby for him. But, you know, he's very passionate when he's talking about his games, though, when he's on these videos, yes, they're, I don't want to say the word amateurish because that sounds like a negative thing. I just mean, you know, it is basically, here's a camera and a mic pointer at you and talk, you know, no flashy effects and that, uh, apart from his intros. But other than that, it's mainly just him talking. But, you know, he's talking about some interesting review games here. I mean, you've got Coleco, you've got uh, Everdell and Euphoria. and you know, But he also mentions some interesting ones where, uh, you know, where he's talking about like why vertical storage is better than horizontal. It's like, I haven't heard that one talked about before. On top of that, you've also got a couple of good ones like top 10 filler games. You know, filler games are like top 10s. And this is one, probably a more controversial one here. More love. Pendulum does not deserve more love. It was rubbish. But like I say, if you want to hear a more positive viewpoint on the game, then by all means, check out that video. Give him some views. Give him some love. You know, he's, he's a very nice bloke. I've met him before. He's just very friendly and just likes games. But when I mentioned a third collaboration, Gems and Biscuits will be the one. So uh, after I'm done with the uh, Nerd Shelves as well as Cinema Pool, after that I'll try and get in uh, Gems and Biscuits for a list. And we don't know what we're going to do yet. Uh, I think his first impression was something like Top 10 Experiences or something like that. I don't know if that's something I'd want to do. It, I mean, my experiences are the fact that I've gone to a convention or that I've met people. It's not so much that I played this game and it just happened to be an amazing experience because I like playing games in general. The game is a means to an end for the social interaction. So um, we might have to think of a different top 10 list, I think. But uh, like I say, I've got some ideas. I'll see if he's got any more ideas. But it's in early stages. You know, the Nerd Shells one is the one that's set in stone for the list, as well as the list for Cine Meeple. Although we need to get a thumbnail out and announce that one properly. But this one is still in the early planning stages. And then, of course, there will be more collaborations to follow. My nice coffee here so I can keep going. But yeah, by all means, give Gems and Biscuits a look. It's a very small channel, as you can see, but all small creators deserve some more love, unbiased views like you wouldn't believe. And, you know, one little defense I will mention here. I, I mentioned this on the Q&A yesterday, actually, where people were sort of quizzing me on the small creator thing. Here's a little story that I had. Uh, I went to a... I'm not going to name names. I'm going to try and keep this uh, sort of low brow. But I went to a convention, local convention in the UK. It had guests, myself included, but also a lot of big names. A lot of them that came from America and like overseas, I mean, in, in Europe as well. Now, what tended to happen was that there was kind of like a ranking system for guests, which I thought was a bit... Hmm dodgy but basically the big overseas guests got like a guest room and all this stuff and all the fancy treatment and live panel show stuff whereas people on my rank were just basically oh you're turned up hi how you doing it's like hmm okay not the way it should be done but never mind but the thing that sort of got my you know, what's the phrase uh got my goat or uh, you know irked me a bit was this is one defense i will make for small creators particularly when it comes to conventions a big creator, you might be able to see them on a live panel show. If you're lucky, you'll get five seconds to talk with that person just to say, hi, how you doing? That's about it. Anything else, and you'll be lucky if you have that opportunity because they're big, they know it, they get 
paraded around all over the place and they are essentially, they know they're the big shots and they're just milking it. But you try and get games with them. You try and get proper social interactions with them, like dinner and drinks or anything like that. Good luck with that. I mean, I don't know if it works differently at American conventions, but certainly at British conventions in Essen, yeah, it's a bit of a different story, really. But a small content creator, when you see them at a convention, they're the sort of people that you will get into conversations, into dinner and drinks, as well as playing games. You know, if you see me at a convention, hopefully, as long as I'm not going to a trade event or like, I'm not due on a stand or anything, then you'll be able to catch me aside and talk to me for a bit. And if it's open gaming, then you'll be able to grab me for a game. I will teach you games. But even then, if I'm on a stand, you'll be able to talk to me properly. Like when I've helped out Dice Tower in the past and stayed on their booth, you can come and talk to me. You know, you don't have to get a ticket or some special invite or anything like that. You can literally just turn up, give me a hug and talk to me. And as much as we're ending the pandemic thing, I want hugs to come back. You know, I don't mind a handshake. This bump just seems a bit too 90s, a bit too 90s hipster or whatever. And I am... And what's the other one? Uh, what did they try to do? They tried to do an elbow bump or something like that back at the start of the pandemic, which I thought was lame. So it's like, come on, give me back the hug. I want hugs back. But yeah, you know... With small creators, you get that level of interaction. You won't get that with the big creators. And if you want further proof, that same convention I mentioned where it was the people in their guest room, I remember I wanted to get a game of Empires of the Void uh, 2 to the table, right? And I was willing to teach as many people as people wanted to join. I set it out, big game, not as many people were that into trying it out, but one person did. And I thought, you know what? Two player, it's nice and quick, I'll play it. I said I want to teach it and I'm happy to teach you, right? So somebody who didn't even necessarily know I was a blogger at the time, but it's like, oh yeah, now I recognize you. It's like, fair enough. But he gets a game with me, one-on-one -on -one game with me as a pokey white man from England, you know, small content creator. But the bigger creators, like the big names, I never saw them play with anybody else but themselves, ever. They were either in their guest room doing whatever they wanted, like just chatting with each other or eating food, you know, or playing their own games. And even when they came out, they basically sat. And I, I'm not kidding. That If I'm sat here, they're sat like there, like six feet away, playing their own games together, no exception. I'm sorry, but that just for me seems selfish. You know, you are so big on your ivory tower that you have not got the time to spend socializing with people who have made you as popular as you are. That just really irked me. I didn't like the way that was. And some of them were, you know, most of them were like, you know, if you're based in America, they saw each other or they could see each other at American conventions. Or if it was a case of, oh, I haven't seen you lot for a while, then schedule some time after the show. Go out for dinner, go out for a drink or something in the evening. Don't use up the entire day of the convention ignoring your fans. That just really, really annoyed me. And, you know, and people have come up to me at conventions who know who I am, and I have happily sat down and taught games from Predator Porter to Empires of the Void 2 to Innovation to, to like Cooper Island, to all sorts. I have taught many, many games to people who watch my show at conventions, providing, of course, I'm not indisposed with something else. And, you know, that is what you can get from a small content creator. You can't get that from the big ones. You know, so how's that for a benefit? Uh, well, rant over. But like I say, go check out uh, Jim and Biscuit's channel. I <laughs> got a little bit sidetracked there. Okay, so let's move on to some news, some very brief news before I get onto the main crux of the list. Uh, first up, I'm going to look at Twilight Imperium 4. Not a game I tend to play, it must be said. <laughs> it's not something I tend to play. But with this one, basically, they release a codex full of new stuff for the game every now and again, which is quite a neat idea. But they recently had a a competition where people could submit their own maps based on a certain format. And they have done this. And then in the recent codex that they released at the end of March, they have printed those maps. So you can get this codex of PDF from the Fantasy Flight website, and it's easy to find. And basically you can get a eight player, seven player, six player, five player, and four player, and even three player map for Twilight Imperium 4. You know, a proper pre-built map. 
and you can try these different little scenarios out and i think this is a cool idea it's not a game i want to play because it's too long and everything i've already played it before and it's like okay fine but it doesn't need to be six hours you know you know what i'm like but you know empires of the void 2 will always be my space game of choice for now hopefully stellaris can uh, be a contender but you know this one you know, it just hasn't sung to me, but I know there's a lot of TI4 fans out there, and if you want some more map ideas, then I suggest you go check out this codex if you haven't already, and try out some of these maps, because I think it's good that Fantasy Flight is releasing free content for people who are fans of one of their bigger sellers. Now, on the subject of a game that I have played, but not necessarily that fussed about, Carcassonne. I just recently culled this from the collection. In fact, there is a cull video I literally just did as to why it's left the collection. I don't dislike the game, I just don't play it that much anymore, I find it's too long with more than three players, and I'm just kind of getting a little bored with it, and Small Islands has replaced it. Check out the video for more information. But literally a day, I think, after I decided I was going to cull it and record the video, they announced the Carcassonne 20th Anniversary Edition. So now you have... <sighs> Frankly, I just don't care. I mean... You know, we're running out of new ideas, so like new innovative ideas. So most people are just literally reprinting the same stuff they've done for a while. And it's not that Carcassonne is a bad game, but all they've said about this is a fresh new look and plenty of Easter eggs for fans, whatever. And basically it will, let's see, it's going to come, it's going to be compatible with a bunch of expansions, although it's not like it's coming with the game. It's just the fact that the recent expansions will be compatible somehow. Although I'm not entirely certain how that's going to work because they're talking about new artwork. Um, you know, the base game is upgraded with a high gloss UV spot print on all the tiles in the box to make sure the details shine. And the box itself comes with gold foil lettering as if I care. And, and the tiles themselves upgraded with brand new illustrations and decorated with characters, though will be still completely compatible with all expansions. How is that possible? How is it possible for you to have new illustrations that are compatible with expansions that have already come out. I, I guarantee the artwork's gonna look different, whether it's the back of the tile or the front of the tile, it's gonna look weird when you start comparing them all together. So I don't see this as being a great thing. I mean, yeah, you get a few extra river tiles, whoopee. Uh, you get some stickers for the meeples that you can do. Okay, nice, I guess, but really, I'm more interested in the map when it comes to Carcassonne, not the meeples, but I mean, Maybe new players can jump in on this when it comes out, but frankly, I think you'd be better off just getting a cheaper edition of it because I suspect this will be expensive as all get out. And do you really care if it's got gold foil lettering on the box and that? Honestly, they announced this and I just did not care. I've already called it. If I ever get Carcassonne back into my collection, it will be a spin off. So South Seas or one of those ones, you know, which I think are better. I think they introduce some nice variant rules and they're standalone. You don't have to worry about a million expansions. I mean, I had four expansions, I think, in my one that I sold to a local player. So hopefully they're having fun with my copy. But yeah, I just honestly, I think we need more ideas from Z-Man here. You know, it's it's not like this has already had at least what, like two revised editions of it or something. I don't think it needs one every five years. In fact, if you're going to do something for the 20th anniversary, here's an idea. Why don't you, you know, consider... Uh, you say, why don't you consider reprinting Carcassonne the City? Eh? Carcassonne the City. Does anybody remember that one? Probably not. But Carcassonne the City was one that I would like to play. It involves you building like a 3D wall around the Carcassonne tiles as you build up a city. I have been wanting to get a copy of this just to try out. But every time I see it, it's like way too expensive because obviously it's out of print, which means nobody will sell it cheap. But this is what I want to see. I would like to see a pimped out version of Carcassonne the City, you know, same sort of deal, but with, you know, cool looking walls, wooden towers and that, with the brand new illustrations and that, and then you could make this a gold foil box or whatever, but this would be a much better idea for a celebratory 20th anniversary thing, because a lot of people want to try out Carcassonne the City. The Dice Tower, I think, it's the best implementation of Carcassonne overall, and honestly, by the sound of it, I reckon it probably would be, but yeah. That seems better. Not this gold UV box, whatever. Honestly, I this is going to come out and I bet it's not going to make any splash whatsoever. Uh, on this front for Marvel Champions. Marvel Champions has another hero pack announced and 
okay, whatever, I guess. I mean, there's a lot of heroes and villains in it now, especially as we've just had the Galaxy's Most Wanted one. And uh, my fear with Marvel Champions is that we're going to quickly get bloat uh, in terms of heroes and that to choose from. But also the difficulty curve is really spiking. I mean, the Galaxy Most Wanted, a lot of those villains are incredibly tough. I mean, I refuse to play it in campaign mode because firstly, the campaign is barely there in terms of a story. But playing it in campaign mode is like playing it in harder mode. You know, and it's already hard. Each of those individual villains, particularly the Collectors and the Ronin one, oh my word, they are hard. But stupidly hard. It's like Green Goblin Mutagen Formula hard, if not worse. And I'm sorry, I don't want this game to get too hard for my enjoyment. Unless you're going to put in an easy mode somewhere. I mean, people who play this on expert mode, seriously, can't you just enjoy the game? I don't get why you want to get beaten down to a pulp or how you're somehow coming up with decks that are so powerful that they can beat normal modes easily but like i say i play it on a casual level so that's there as for this one this is agent venom so we have you know not venom as in the venom i want as in venom anti-spider-man venom no we have agent venom as in the Flash Thompson version from the lore that is technically a guardian of the galaxy and who goes around various places in space with lots of cool weapons and that and uses his abilities to, as like a, I think he was like an army dude in this bit of the lore, I don't know, I forget. He's a, a wartime veteran and an old classmate. The thing is, so he, he was a classmate of Peter Parker and then eventually became a wartime veteran? How? I'm not sure, I mean, I don't know the uh, Marvel lore when it comes to Flash Thompson, but, you know... So this guy is basically going to go in with weapons as his forte. So there's, um, you know, you're allowed more upgrades with a restricted keyword. Uh, you can get more guns. You've got uh, your obviously your tendrils like you have normally. And you might enrage the symbiote. Apart from that, there's not a huge amount of details as to exactly how this one's going to work. But I can't see this one being that popular a pack when it comes out. But as I say... I don't know much about this character, so I think it's just going to be a case of it comes out and I go, eh, more variety, why not? It's not like, say, the the big hit that something like Doctor Strange or Wonder, you know, Wonder Vision, Wonder Vision, sorry, uh, you know, Maximoff, Wonder, Wonder Maximoff, Scarlet Witch, <laughs> it had when this thing was released. So, like I say, more content, great, but not exactly that hype for it. And finally, we still don't have much detail as to what's happening for UK viewers, what's happening with the UK Games Expo. All they have said on their website is that they plan to run a physical show from the uh, 30th of July to the 1st of August 2021. But until they get the report back from the events research program as to the pandemic and that, they don't know what restrictions will be in place. And so they don't know how many tickets they're going to do, and what the show will even look like. So they have been very vague on this. But hopefully they're going to be selling tickets after April finishes and have more detail on it. Now, do I want to attend this show? Yes, <laughs> I kind of do, because I am... Oh, I have been so long without a convention and social interaction. I need these pronto. So if this is on, there's a good chance I'm going to go to it. But I do need to know what these restrictions are. I mean, I can put up with some restrictions. I mean, I think wearing a mask would be kind of pointless at that point. Because by that point, the entire UK will be vaccinated. Although maybe for European people, there's going to be a bigger restriction because obviously the European uh, vaccination program is not going according to plan compared to ours. It's like the one thing we're getting right is vaccinations. So I mean, go figure, the UK actually gets something right. But it, I, I wouldn't want to wear one all the time. But checks and all that on the door and using hand sanitizer and that, I mean, fine, I'll get over that. I mean, frankly, I was using hand sanitizer before it was cool. I always carry a small bottle in my coat when I go out and after I've been to the loo I will usually squirt a bit of hand sanitizer on as a bit of extra care before I play somebody else's game I'll usually squirt a bit on my hand and as a bit of extra care in case you know I don't know what their hygiene's like with their game but also if I'm eating food while playing a game or something I'll usually use hand sanitizer so that you haven't got all my food and grippy bits on there so I was using it already as a general hygiene tool before the pandemic started. It just meant that I used mine a lot more when the pandemic started. So, the, you know, I can deal with that. It's really going to come down to what's at the show, though. I mean, 
the restriction on open gaming could be a killer because I obviously want to see what's at the trade show and I hope that publishers will still go to it, but the logistics of Brexit as well as the pandemic are going to cause issues, I think. But then the other problem is what's the open gaming going to be like? Because when the trade show finishes, I want to play games with people. I want to socialize with others. And if there's a restriction on available space, especially as there's rumors that I think the hotel is in refurbishment. I mean, what dumb hotel does refurbishment after a pandemic ends? That seems a little bit moronic. But if that happens, then that's a bunch of open space gaming that's lost. And the hotels are not very usually very receptive on doing open gaming. So if I'm going to get into a situation where after I've been to a smaller trade show, there's nothing to do, that's going to put me off the show. So we'll have to wait and see. Hopefully they will come back with some positive deals as to what the show is going to be about. I don't care about live events. I don't care about live panels and all that. I don't care about tournaments. If you're going to scrap anything, scrap tournaments. I was never interested in those anyway apart from like LCG cooperative ones, but even then I can live without that because they take up a lot of the time. You know, who knows, maybe to justify some of the time there, I'll have to help out on the booth. I mean, Greater Than Games are a sponsor of it, so I suspect they would be there. Maybe they would like somebody to help teach Spirit Island or uh, Sentinels in the Multiverse. That'd be quite cool, actually. Uh, maybe, because I doubt the Dice Tower would be there. So if I need something to do, then maybe I could help out Greater Than Games. Or if Portal are going to be there, maybe I could help out Ignacy Trevor Check with stuff. Who knows? Like I say, speculation, we'll just have to wait and see. But certainly, I will try and attend as many UK conventions as I can that get arranged for the rest of the year. Whether they are tiny ones that are just for playing games or big trade shows. If Essen goes ahead, again, depending on what restrictions they have, I will certainly like to go to that. But... We have no idea what's going to happen with Essen at this point. You know, people are still being very paranoid for the rest of 2021. I mean, local conventions here should be fine because let's face it, we're expecting to have the entire adult population vaccinated by the end of June. Like the end of June, everybody in the UK will be vaccinated who needs to be vaccinated and then some. You know, I'm expecting to get mine in my early May, I suspect, you know, because I'm in the 30s bracket. So they're currently starting on the 40s. So that should take up most of April. So I'm expecting early May to get mine. So fingers crossed I'll have mine in place before our lockdown eases further on the 17th of May when suddenly we can go to indoor restaurants and go to board game cafes again. Cannot wait. That's going to be such a good day. I'm going to be like so high on that day. I'm going to make a big deal of it and spend the whole day at Dice. You know, maybe I'll do some... Uh, uh, extra overtime at work and get some time off in lieu and then like leave work early on that day or something because I cannot wait. But anyway, like I say, we will have to see. All right, let's get on to the crux of the show then. Uh, well, I say the crux, you know, the, the main topic area. Very conveniently today, apparently, and maybe I'm wrong, I don't know, but I don't care, but today has been mentioned that it is National Pet Day. No, apparently it is National Pet Day. Whether it exists or not, I don't know, but it says here, 11th of April, 2021 is National Pet Day 2021. I don't know of anybody who celebrates this at all. However, I'm more interested in these kind of holidays than real ones. I mean, oh, Halloween and Christmas and Easter, whatever. I mean, I went home for my birthday and to see my parents and brother. I didn't care it was Easter, all right? It's just more chocolate to go in my system. In fact, Oh no, my mum feeds me like it's Hansel and Gretel. So yeah, I like I say, I just get overfed. Christmas, whatever. I don't get presents anymore because I'm too old. I just buy my own presents. I, I buy my own stuff when I want to buy it. So why do, what are you going to buy me as a Christmas present? Um, you know, and we have this agreement in the family that that's how it is. We just get a little bit of money for spending on what we want. Mainly Christmas is the fact that I get to go home and see the family and have a big roast dinner and that. That's why I go home. And I can do that on any weekend. It doesn't have to be Christmas. Christmas is just too commercial now. And the same goes for Halloween and all that. But I like these random ones like National Coffee Day, National Art Day, National Pet Day. Nobody ever celebrates them, but they're just a bit more interesting. They're not commercialized. It's just like, you know what? Randomly on this day, I'm just going to celebrate this for the hell of it. I mean, isn't May the 4th Star Wars Day? So people go out of their way to do Star Wars stuff on the May the 4th. So why not this? You know, I'm quite in it. And so I would like to get a pet at some point. I really would like a cat or a dog. Preferably a cat, they're lower maintenance, and I think cats are cute. 
but I don't want to get a pet while I live alone because if I'm out of the house for ages and my normal routine, the cat's going to get, even a cat will get lonely, a dog will have a hissy fit. So, you know, I know cats are independent, but a cat needs love and attention eventually. It needs feeding. So I feel that while I live alone, a pet is not really something I can do. But if I ever meet a girlfriend, a, girl, a gamer geek girlfriend and move in with them or something, then obviously first thing I want to discuss is, look, I don't want kids. Can we have pets? You want to be crazy cat lady and have free cats in exchange for never having kids? I am perfectly up for that. You know, that is the way I would like to run things. But, you know, I've been asking on Twitter for people's uh, uh, pictures of pets, actually. So I wonder if I can bring up my Twitter page, my profile and see if I've got any more like pictures of pets that people have submitted to me. because it's been really cute. Have a look. Uh, that's my pinned post. That was my announcement, my quote. Come on, there's going to be some more pets. There's all my pets. Certain that there's more pets. Maybe on the notifications. Uh, ah, here we go. Board on the air. Lovely cute little kitty there. Uh, staring into my soul, kitty. Um, cat in Roll for Galaxy box. Is I like, you know, obviously hasn't played Isle of Cats yet. Uh, what have we got? Uh, yep, <laughs> another cat. One of the dogs. Another cat, Orpheus. Uh, we've got uh, Benny and Sam. One doesn't look very uh, happy to be part of a photo there, but it's just like, oh, this little kitty. Love little kitty. Little kitty weedy. It's saying dog and cat there. So, yeah, I've been asking people to sort of show me their pets, and, you know, this is always good fun. I just love animals. I don't, I'm just not a kids fan. I don't want kids. I just don't think I'd be a suitable dad. I think I would just go mad and stress out like crazy, and I just don't go mad for them. So, pets though i will fall in love with your pet the second i see it if you've got a pet cat i'll be trying to like stroke it and talking like kitty weedy to it all the time and playing with it if i see a dog i'll give it all the love and attention it deserves as long as it's like not afraid to see me or anything so i really love animals i, I just like animals animals are cool so i thought for a bit of a laugh on this episode i thought i would do a top five list on a subject that i don't Think I was ever going to tackle in a top 10 list. I did contemplate the idea, but I never really found time to get it off the ground. And I thought, all right, well, let's just do a top five here. And we're going to do top five games that feature animals on behalf of National Pet Day. Now, caveat, very quick caveats with this. Firstly, I did not include dinosaurs as animals. I, I'm sure a dinosaur, I think, is actually classed as an animal. But unless you're going to give me a velociraptor as a pet, I don't think it kind of suits what I'm going for. So no dinosaur island on this list. Also, I'm going for games where the animals are the forefront of the game. So, I mean, they're either plastered all over the artwork or all the characters are animals or the animal is the main theme of the game. So, for example, I would not put something like Fields of Arl on the list, despite me my favorite Uwe Rosenberg game, because yes, you can make, you can herd sheep and cows and same with Agricola and Caverna, but you cannot, you know, you can do a lot of other things as well. Like in Caverna, yes, I can have sheep, I can have cows, I can have donkeys, but then I could ignore animals entirely and just do grain farming, vegetable farming, go adventuring, go mining, go build rooms. I can do a lot of stuff that isn't the animals. The animals are a part of the game, not the focal point. And for example, Snowtails does not make my list because as much as I love Snowtails and it is themed around husky dogs, you don't really remember that while you're doing the game. I mean, you see the map and there's no indication of the dogs other than the cardboard thing in front of you that you place cards on. Other than that, that's I thought that was a little bit weak in terms of going, oh yeah, this is seen around animals. So no, the five that I have chosen are like, you cannot escape the fact that this is animal themed for whatever reason. And there was still a fair few good choices I could make. So I'm just going to talk briefly about my top five. My coffee's getting a little bit cold. I need to uh, down this in quick fashion. Ugh, there we go. Which means I'm now going to be buzzing as high as a kite for the rest of this video. But, yep, my number five. Now, this one is a game that I do enjoy, but I don't think it's like the bee's knees. I think it's a little overrated, but then why is it on my top five? I still enjoy it, but not enough to want to buy every expansion for it and not enough to want to play it over and over again. But I want to try out some of the other expansions for it. And as much as I don't own it, I know people who do own it. And of course, how can you not put it on a list like this? That is, of course, Everdell. 
Everdell, 7 out of 10. You know, I, I like it. I just don't love it. But Everdell, yeah, if you're into animals, this is definitely one of the games you've got to look at for this purpose because it's just plastered with animals. You know, the cover, and this is like one of the best artworks you get in a game. Look at it. It's like something like I have animals of farthing wood. You know, you've got the badger there, little mouse, little squirrels, little rodents and that. And then, of course, the big tree, the forest, the river, and everything is an animal. So you've got, you know, the historian is a bat. Uh, the fool is a skunk, apparently. You know, the teacher is a crow. Uh, you know, all your meeples are bunnies or rabbits or toads and stuff like that. Uh, you get the expansion, you can get mounts, uh, like an ox mount and a horse mount. And I, I mean, I forget how it works. I haven't played that expansion yet. Spire Crest, I think it's called. But all this artwork is just plastered with lots of lovely animals. Everything is animals. By the time you come away from this, you will, like, boom, I mean, that's a... A lot of cards on show there, but, you know, you cannot not think of animals when playing this beautiful card game. As I say, I, I like it. I just don't love it. I just think it's got a bit bloated now, and certainly the Kickstarter was really good value, but considering you, some of the expansions were a bit lackluster, and, you know, I didn't like Pearlbrook, and the fact that you can't even use certain expansions with each other, and it just takes it to a level where it's like, oh god, this game's going to go on forever. I do think it's a bit long for what it is. You know, I have issues with the game, but I still think for this list, it needed at least a decent mention on number five, because I still enjoy the game, just not as much as these other four. So, moving on to my number four, I mentioned I wasn't going to put Fields of Arl or Caverna or Agricola on the list. Well, I was half right. But there is a spin-off called Agricola All Creatures Big and Small. This is a two-player only game, and I've still got the two-player game there, even though it doesn't get played much because it's a two-player. But I really like this two-player game. It's basically focused all around the animals. So whereas in Agricola you've got the like vegetable farming, the grain farming, and the building of the house and stuff like that, here, yeah, you do have an element of building the rooms. But for the most part, you are focused around the animals. You are trying to get the sheep, you're trying to get the pigs, you're trying to get the horses, you're building the enclosures for them, and by the end of the day, you will have a nice little farm with lots of animals, and I mean a lot of animals, and maybe some extra rooms to go around. So yes, you do have some, you know, farm building as well, but there's no farming green or you know, coal. coal. <laughs> what kind of farm is this? You know, vegetables or anything like that. It's mainly get the horses and that in these paddocks and, you know, get points that way. It's just a very nice, simple two-player worker placement game, very light and fluffy, where I don't think it, oh, it had a couple of expansions for more rooms and I've got that because I've got like the uh, deluxe set in there, but <laughs> I like that big sheep there. That's quite funny, but it's just, very nice, very pleasant, very sort of zen soothing, apart from the fact that obviously somebody is uh, blocking you in terms of, you know, nicking your space. But yeah, you know, if you are more interested in the animal side of Agricola, then this is one you definitely want to check out, um, particularly if it's just something you need two players that's very simple that you could play in about 30 minutes uh, once you know what you're doing. Okay. Number three, a relatively new game in terms of what I have played. I love cats, so of course I got to enjoy a game that is all about cats. The Isle of Cats, to be more precise. This is a polyomino style game where you are laying the Tetris pieces, as we know from like Baron Park and that. Strange enough, Baron Park did not make the list because the, it's themed around bears. I think it would probably be my six or seven. It's, you know, it's probably a bit below these, but, you know, the bear theme is, it could have literally been any theme of the Baron Park one or something. And technically, I suppose that that can apply for the Isle of Cats. But I do like the fact that they do make an effort to, like, make the cats all look really nice and cute seeing out with all these different uh, styles. But here you are trying to get the cats on your boat. You're saving them from an island before some other person turns up. And, you know, all these cats have got, look at the cute, look at that blue one there in the middle. Doesn't he look adorable? man up but uh you know all these different color cats are getting on there along with the treasures that you try to fill up the spaces you've also got lesson cards that you are using in order to like gain points by having cats like around the edge or blue cats together you're trying to get families of them so that the colors you know they stay with the same color but then you've also got restrictions on how many cats you can mm, that's charming <laughs> licking itself 
but you've got other ways to get points by those cards and I'm trying to find an example of said cards which is proving a little bit uh, tricky at the moment hopefully I'll be able to find something but essentially these oh clicked the wrong button there but essentially these cards allow you to score points in various different ways so you can't ignore them you need to consider oh yeah maybe I'd like to get points by ways other than just getting cats so here's a few of them that they're being used here you get quite a lot of them by the time this game is over but it looks beautiful very simple rules a lot of people like the whole polyomino style of laying games but the lesson cards add just a little bit of extra flair to the formula the flaw i do have with this one is that i find that the public lessons that are in this where like all players can score yeah, that could have been explored a little bit better. I don't think they have much of an impact on the game. It's really getting those blue cards in front of you and you cannot skimp on them. Do not think you're going to win the game by having next to no lessons because you are just not going to score the points. But everything looks nice. The cats are so cute and lovely and you just want to save them all. And everybody's making cat jokes. It's a solid nice polyomino game on my shelf in the other room. And the lid is even big enough for your cat to actually fit in it as displayed here. <laughs> where everybody has probably got a photo where the cat is using the lid as the box. Because it even has in the box a diagram to say this is where your cat goes here in setup. And just look at that cat. <laughs> They're just so cute. I love cats. I love cats so much. Um, but yes, moving on to my number two. Two, my number two, I taught this to my parents uh, recently, and especially my dad, who is a fanatic when it comes to this type of animal, and I was scared to teach him this, because when it comes to my parents, I gotta keep games dirt simple, otherwise it's gonna be a frustrating time to teach them, and uh, was a little bit frustrating, rinse repeating myself with rules, you know, because they're not particularly well adept on this sort of thing, I have to give them, you know, the benefit of the doubt because they're you know they're getting old and <laughs> I love them the bits but blimey it takes a lot to get them to learn games but I could not not teach Wingspan to my dad because Wingspan besides being a fantastic 10 out of 10 game he is a bird fanatic he's got we bought him a pair of binoculars for his birthday he's got bird books and he's got like a uh, various bird tables and god knows what else in their garden all sorts of little local birds come by even like a pheasant comes by every now and again strutting his stuff around the area and you know he will tell me like you know what's that bird there what's that bird there and it's like i might be able to possibly point you at a blackbird a crow and maybe a robin or something but other than that my knowledge on birds is pretty lacking but this wingspan is all birds. Everything is bird, 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 bird. And the cards, everything looks beautiful in this. The egg pieces, the boards, the artwork, everything is drop dead gorgeous. And every card is a unique bird with a unique power, as well as some trivia, not trivia, but uh, some, you know, useful intel on what the bird is. You've got Americans, you've got Europeans, and now you've got Oceana birds with the recent expansions. I need to give that uh, expansion more of a play because I was teaching them this, like, just the base set because, frankly, I do not want to... Oh, no, I did eventually throw European birds in because it wasn't the biggest change, but even some of those abilities were flummoxing my mum. You know, she has to be kept really simple when it comes to these games, but at least it was a success. They did enjoy it. You know, probably would they get a copy themselves? I don't know, but I'm certainly going to bring it home and show it to them as often as I can. But yeah, if you're into birds, there is no reason not to give Wingspan a play because you've got all the birds you could ever like and all of them look cool. I mean, I like birds too. Birds are cool. I just don't know a huge amount about them. And so finally, before we wrap up this episode, the number one game that features all sorts of animals on all, well... Is they're not on all the cards, but the, they're on a lot of the cards. The whole game is themed around the fact that everybody's an animal, but these particular merchant animals, you know, have all their individual decks that play out much like the animal would be, and that is Dale of Merchants. Dale of Merchants is my favorite game that is themed around animals specifically. Um, I haven't rated all the various expansions because they're all like different sets, but of course I have the Dale of Merchants collection. I have the big shiny box with uh, uh, Semi Laxo's uh, artwork on there, and blimey, does it look good. I mean, look at that. It is beautiful artwork all round on this, but it is my favorite deck building game. 
I mean, it keeps fighting for Valley of the Kings uh, to be like the number one, but I think Dale of Merchants is currently my number one deck builder. It's very simple to learn, very simple to play and teach, but it's got so much depth with all these different faction cards that belong to the different animals. I've got so many of them now. I've even got cosmic encounter-esque like asymmetrical powers from the, uh, the collection set that you can vary the game even more, although... Well, you can use some of them when teaching the game, but only the easy ones. Only the green ones, not the yellow or red ones, because they are pretty <laughs> involved. But here you've got a set of cards all themed around the penguins. You've got one here themed around the you know, turtles. You know, the, what do they call it? The exquisite worth? The earthquake? I can't read that. Oh, enthusiastic wood turtles. And... All of them have got some kind of theme to go with the cards. I mean, for example, the uh, the trash pandas, <laughs> the raccoons, tend to mess around with other people's stuff. Um, these uh, bats here, the uh, I forget what type of bat they are, tomb bats or something, but basically they care as to whether everything's kind of on a day and night cycle. So it's quite an interesting mechanic. Yeah, after all, they are bats. Uh, we've got the mongooses, you've got uh, pangolins, you've got uh, gut. I think that's a promo one. Uh, oh, yeah, artwork not final. I was going to say, that is not the typical artwork there. But even just from the original set, you've got the pandas, you've got the flying squirrels, as I mentioned, trash pandas, you've got... Uh, did polar bears feature? I can't recall. As I say, there is so much content for this game that I will never be short of stuff to mold together. You basically pick several of the factions, merge them together into one big deck, there's your market deck, and you're building the stalls. So it's a race to get to the end of the stalls. So it's not even a VP game like it typically is. But this is such a good, fun deck building game. It deserves way more buzz. Not enough people talk about this game. And, you know, honestly, like I, said, I don't know what more I can really say that's great about it. It's just really good fun. I mean, look, all these ones even tell you what like complexity rating they are and stuff like that. It's just a really solid game game you know it sort of ticks the boxes for what i want from a nice approachable deck builder is it gateway level probably not i would say next step up i think dominion star realms and rune stones would be easier games to learn than this one but this is definitely a next step but i really enjoy this one it's a you know a great game and you know one that's going to be in the collection for a long time and if i ever want to get my animal fix then yeah you cannot say more than Dale of Merchants. Ooh, there we go. So yeah, that is my top five games themed around animals. It's a silly little list. You know, how much use you're going to get out of it is another thing. But I just wanted to do something for National Pet Day. I thought it was just coincidence that it happened to fall on the episode uh, launch day. So I figured, why not? Let's just talk about animals. Because animals are cool. You know, humans can be evil. Animals can't. And animals can be cute. Humans have to do a lot more work in order to do that. So it's, <laughs> okay, that's a bit weird, but whatever. Probably rambling on now. So hopefully you've enjoyed this podcast episode. You'll notice the format was a little bit different on the screen. If you're watching this on YouTube, um, I had a comment where somebody had asked if I could reduce the amount of space taken up with that. When they say with ads, these aren't really ads. It's just highlighting the name of the blog as well as the fact that I'm on the Dice Tower Network and, you know, obviously saying be a Patreon on Patreon and see me on Facebook and Twitter. And I mean, that's all they are. They're not really ads per se, but it did allow, what I've done is I basically tweaked the OBS screen to reduce that down. So you'll notice they're taking up much less space. I've enlarged my personal camera. So I'm getting a bigger view here. But then I've also slightly widened the web browser part. So hopefully the images and the writing and that are a little bit clearer. Like I say, by all means, give me your feedback. I don't know if I could really squeeze it anymore. This is about as much real estate as I can get on the screen here. But uh, hopefully it's more, you know, hopefully it's a subtle improvement to what it was last time. You know, I do take on constructive feedback where necessary. So that's it for me. I'm going to get on with editing this podcast so I can launch it later. Obviously, check out the rest of the content on my channel. I hope you look forward to the uh, live stuff that's coming soon in terms of collaborations and some of the other variety content I've got. And I just look forward to talking to you soon, whether it's on a live stream or hopefully face-to-face -face at a convention. Honestly, when I know what conventions I'm going to for certain, I will make a big deal I'm going to them. And so I will be more than happy to try and catch you at a convention just to talk to you or even to play games. Maybe there's a game on my shelf you've been itching to try and you'd like me to teach you at a convention, then 
Maybe there'll be a chance I can do just that, as I said before earlier in the episode, with a small content creator, there's a chance you might be able to get that ha have that happen, whereas with a big creator, you can't. Hashtag support small creators. So that's it for me. I'm going to shoot off now. Take care, everybody. And remember, as always, it's only a game. Bye for now. Take care. Love you all. Stay safe. And I'll see you next time.